And a very good afternoon and a warm welcome. If there's one subject in some shape or form that we all know and have dealt with in some description, it is, of course, the question of climate change. But every bit of research also shows that whilst most people realize the significance and the importance of climate change, there's nothing that's going to bore them faster or make them run in the opposite direction. It's a bit like being told to eat your vegetables with dinner. You know you should do it, but nobody really wants to just yet. And yet the issue of climate change is so existential and so fundamental that it can be delayed no longer. And not only that, even as we are dealing with the aftermath of pandemic and, of course, the horrific nature of a war in Europe with supply chain issues left, right and centre, whilst the temptation is to say, well, we'll deal with that later. We know climate change is important, but there are other things that are more pressing. What I expect the panel to discuss and, and say is why we can't delay, we can't ignore. We have to maintain the impetus, but that raises another question. How do you engage people in climate change activity when there are so many other things to be dealt with that are arguably more pressing, more urgent? Well, when you, I know somebody in this room will say, what could be more urgent than the destruction of the planet? Well, it doesn't quite work that way. So we have an excellent panel. Excellent, who know the subject backwards. And Gozi Okonjo Iwala is the Director General of the World Trade Organization and a member of the Board of Trustees of WEF. Good to see you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. Vanessa Nakati is a founder of the Rise Up Climate Movement. I think you describe yourself as an activist, is that right? A climate activist. What does that mean? I advocate for the planet and the people. Right. We will get to your, your activating. Christoph Schweitzer is the Chief Executive Officer, the CEO of Boston Consulting. What is the one thing that you need us to understand today? That there's reason for optimism, despite all the slowness of some things happening. I think we are moving. Anish Shah is with us, the Managing Director and CEO of the Mahindra Group of India, and also on the International Business Council. Um, Anish, the one thing you're going to hopefully get across today is that a lot of action has been taken already, but that is not enough. It's not about individual actions, it's about collaboration and working collectively, because the goals we've set are bold, and we need to find a way to meet them. Jasper is with us, Jasper Broden, the chief, the CEO of Inca Group, which is IKEA, Inca Multiple, IKEA of the Netherlands, International Business Council, and the co-chair of the Alliance of CEO Climate Leaders. Let's start with that, what is it? The Alliance is basically 120 companies today um, representing a big responsibility in the world with a footprint collectively that is the size of India, basically. So it's a group of leaders who are uh, motivated uh, for the right reasons to actually not be part of the talk, but be part of the actions to, to actually resolve the issue. We'll come back in more detail to find sure. out what you're doing. Um, uh, Director General, the, the temptation for us to sort of put off actions, even post Paris and post COP26. And everybody's saying, well, there are more important issues at the moment. Like you and I talked about last night, food insecurity, for example. Why would that be a mistake? It would be a terrible mistake, uh, Richard, because the consequences of inaction are in front of us every day in every continent, in so many countries. Look at what is happening in the Sahel. People are migrating because of the increasing droughts. Herders are moving southwards and conflict between herders and farmers is intensifying. And it's all been due to climate change. Lakes are drying up. If these people, if we don't take action, you have a set of people who are climate migrants who have to go somewhere. So I'm just using that as one example. You saw the floods in Germany. You saw the fires in Australia, <clears throat> in California. Uh, so the action is, the urgency is now. I, can't, I don't see why anyone would say 
let's put it off. Yes, it is true that we are in a world of simultaneous crisis, each happening at the same time. The climate change, the food, the pandemic, international security. But I don't think we prioritize the others because they are all linked. They are all crises of the global commons. Can I come in on that, please? Just jump in, please. Don't wait to be invited. Yeah, I, I think that it's really important to understand the intersection of these crises. And when we talk about climate change, we are also talking about food insecurity. Because, for example, look at the Eastern Africa drought that has left more than 26 million people with no access to food. So there is definitely a connection with food insecurity and climate change. When we talk about poverty eradication, as families are continuously losing their homes, sources of income, their farms, they are being driven into extreme poverty. As children drop out of school, this poverty moves on from generation to generation. So we understand that we can't even eradicate you know, poverty without talking about climate justice. Nobody doubts the significance of the issue. Exactly. My point is, how do you continue to emphasize that significance when there are so many other things that mm -hmm. arguably are more pressing? It starts from understanding how these things are interconnected. It's like we are in one system. And if one part of the system is broken, eventually the whole system comes crumbling down. If we are in this room and where you're seated has a hole in the roof and it starts to leak, if I don't do anything about it, eventually this whole room will be filled with water and we will all be impacted. So I have to fix what is on, you know, where you're seated for the benefit of all of us. So if we talk about the climate crisis, we are also addressing food insecurity. <clears throat> and isn't there, just give us the, the CEO view of the difficulty, and don't tell me it's, it, you know, you're doing it. Tell me the challenge of maintaining the, the climate agenda or the climate action when there are so many other pressing issues for the company? Richard, the challenge for most CEOs is that they have to deliver results that their investors want. And the question will be, does this come in the way or not? But that is where we really need a paradigm change. Because we've always believed that purpose drives profits. Mm. And therefore, you have to start with purpose. We started our climate journey in 2008. So actually, we have been taking a lot of actions with regard to climate change. Uh, and as we've gone through that journey, we found that it will actually deliver results. So for us, if you were to ask me my top three priorities for the Mahindra Group, uh, which is in 20 industries across 100 companies with 200 countries with 270,000 people, climate change is among the top three priorities for us. Uh, Christoph, you and your, your clients and the people you work with, what are they telling you about the difficulties of maintaining the climate action. And, and the reason I'm, I'm not trying to be unduly pessimistic, but everybody in this room, by virtue of the entrance ticket to this room, agrees with the importance of climate change. Mm. What we need to understand is the difficulty of maintaining the action at a time where there are other priorities. So if you just go back, the last two to three years, Richard, I think you described it in your opening, right? I mean, most corporate leaders, I think many of the people here in Davos, had their hands full navigating through COVID. They had their hands full navigating through the Ukraine and Russia and uh, secondary tertiary effects of that. It just absorbed a lot of managerial attention. I do think that's no good reason, however, right? I mean, there are practical necessities that we are all facing and that I see with our clients, but I mean, in the end, we are just running out of time. And I think you are very much uh, pointing in the right direction here. I mean, it's just an interconnected set of issues and climate change is one of them, but it goes much further. And so, look, if you take all this, what, what, what does it take to make sure we move faster? I think there are a couple of mechanisms that I'm observing with the clients that we work with. There is one reason for optimism, which is there's a true generational change happening amongst the CEOs and senior leaders. I think if you become in charge of a company at this point and you expect to lead this for the next three, five, seven, ten years, ESG and commitment to climate is not optional 
I mean, it is an absolute must. You will not succeed. In fact, you will fail utterly if you don't deliver on the agenda. It's very different than if you put something on paper and you know in two years from now I'm going to be out of here. Uh, I think it's a very different level of commitment. The second point, and I think it ties back to some of the talk here uh, at Davos, we are in incredible talent scarcity everywhere in the world, in most industries, also in types of jobs that we never anticipated would be scarce and where talent would be scarce. You will never be a credible employer if you are not delivering on your climate, sustainability, and ESG agenda going forward. We have done a talent survey around the world. On a global level, roughly 50% of people who graduate from university, Richard, are looking at the serious commitment of uh, the employer. But then, I mean, you are just not going to get these people if you don't. So I'm optimistic about that. And then the third thing is it is just becoming also financially truly costly. I mean, if uh, you look at energy prices, the price of uh, the emission certificates, if you look at the fact that you now pay higher interest rates if you are not uh, moving on the ESG side, I think there's a real economic cost. That's why I'm optimistic. Richard, I'm going to jump in yeah. here without invitation, if that's OK. <laughs> if you wait for an invitation, you'll wait a long time. Then I'm going to jump in after him. Uh, no, you're not, because... <laughs> no, you're not, because Jasper hasn't had a chance to, and he wanted to jump in uh, first. So, so I'll let's jump go. in after him. You, you'll, there'll be plenty of jumping, and you can jump in later. <laughs> <laughs> so I would agree with Christoph that it's not optional anymore. <clears throat> Having been in dozens of conversations, especially over the last year on this topic, I see a lot greater momentum. And I see major leaders around the world uh, completely on board with the question that they have to act. <coughs> so the bigger question, though, is not whether this is important or not. It is what are the types of actions can we take that actually make a difference? Because for us to reverse the 1.5 degrees that we have to, what we do at the marginal level is not going to work. We do not have the technologies today to be able to meet our commitments for 2040 or 2050 to be net zero. And therefore, we have to collectively act. So therefore, the bigger question is, how do we collectively act? Right. And then I'm going to jump in. Is that allowed? <laughs> Go ahead. Fantastic. Thank you. I, I, would, I would just uh, start by agreeing on two things. We, I hear from uh, more and more CEOs today, which is an interesting thing that there is a myth that CEOs of big companies wouldn't be driven by purpose. And I see uh, it's getting more empty on the platform with people who don't uh, express why they're in this, uh, why this, in spite of the calamities we're experiencing, is important for them as per, uh, persons. We hear about co-workers, uh, colleagues, uh, the motivation to attract the best. And if I can add there, if you want to be relevant for consumers, not only tomorrow, but already today, uh, you're in trouble if you're not a leader in this uh, sphere. But what I would like to add maybe to the conversation is, which is also a big misconception, most of this is going to make massive sense for business. And I don't have to add taxation. That is going to be a big issue uh, down the road in a couple of few years only. But to miss the opportunity to be climate smart it means not being resource smart and not being cost smart. So the business side of this is the thing that I believe is going to drive the speed in this more than anything else. Now I can jump in. So you've heard all I the good... I just took a breath, but... <laughs> <laughs> I like this She'll take now. <laughs> and Josie will take a moment. <laughs> it's not going to happen again. So, so don't take a breath while talking. <laughs> yeah, now you've heard all the... Everybody's tied up. We have to do it now. Now let's... A little bit of realism. Perhaps the reason why, at least from the point of view of, of governments in poor countries, in, they, they have to attend to the crisis, quote unquote, now, and they may discount a bit the climate change. It requires financing. Mm. It requires money to tackle some of these problems. And so they have to make, as a former minister of finance, you have to make trade-offs right there. You know, am I going to look for how to take care of the people who are being hit by the food crisis right now because I don't have enough resources? Or am I going to do something else? So the world had promised, or developed countries, let me pull back, that to help tackle this climate change, there would be $100 billion a year to help poor countries meet the costs. That hasn't been done the way it should be. So um, I think you have to also 
look at that angle, and, and it's not talked about as much. It needs money right. to be able to do this. Okay, so, the, 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 go on. No, I just, I, I think uh, the money, the, the, I think it's a disgrace personally that the world hasn't been able to match the 100 million. And what I understand also is that we will need much more than that, of course, in the transition. Absolutely. But one thing that I would like to add to the conversation is we are, we are already into action. And one of the barriers that we are hitting as corporate leaders is we need support from policymakers to enable quicker decisions on wind but farms. I, no, we'll come to that in a second. I want, stick, I want to stick with the money. Okay. Um, 100 billion was yeah. promised. Yes. Per year. Per year, Thank yes. Per year. Yeah. But uh, times have changed a bit. Absolutely. Since it, since it was promised. Uh, there was a pandemic. There was a pandemic. And what happened, Richard? We suddenly saw 14 trillion. We suddenly saw massive fiscal stimulus, money coming out of everywhere. Which was, nece which was necessary. I agree completely. It was the right policy response. But then it has bred skepticism. If these, the developed countries could come up with that amount of money in this short amount of time, what's 100 billion compared to 14 trillion? So the times have changed, but those times have changed in asking more questions. Why can't we come up with this money? Right, but we're also going into a an era now of higher interest rates, high inflation, mm -hmm. where the money's going to be even harder. It will be even harder for the poor countries. Many of them are already debt distressed. So, so yes, there are no excuses. There are no excuses on this. So my take is the financing challenge, Gozi, that you mentioned in particular for the poorer countries is very real. You know, I don't think there's a way to dismiss that. I would also challenge the Western world, uh, the developed markets, I don't think that many companies fail with their climate action because there's no funding. I do think you can get a whole lot of capital for a whole lot of things, and um, I do think it's possible. I do think that's a cheap excuse, in my mind. Yeah? I would also just observe that more and more corporate leaders are basically realizing that the political and the governmental part is not going to help because the political cycle is one, depending on where you are, four years, five years, six years, investing uh, into climate action typically doesn't yield easily measurable and demonstrable results in that thing. So the corporate leaders, Richard, are basically saying, well, okay, I give up, I move myself. And um, I mean, we have great examples in, in some markets in Germany, for example, the German Industry Association, BDI, basically put together their path to net zero because they got incredibly frustrated that nothing is happening. So they came to the government and put a paper in front of them and said, look, this is what we could do. This is what it would cost. And that became, I mean, essentially one important input for the coalition agreement in Germany. I do think this whole kind of corporate world waiting for governments in general, I think is gonna be a dead end. Yeah? So, I mean, I really encourage corporate leaders where they can to move faster and to not wait. Let me answer. Yeah, I also think there's really a huge responsibility on the Global North to provide the climate finance that was promised. And also there is a demand for a compensation fund for loss and damage as well. We know who caused the climate crisis and we know who needs to pay for it. So loss and damage is something that is already happening in so many communities across the Global South. And it's pushing, the climate crisis is pushing people to places where they cannot adapt anymore. In just do, a minute. Well, no, no, hang on. If you do loss and damage, do you not open a can of worms that makes it much more difficult to get consensus? I'm not denying the loss and damage, but I'm saying the moment you start looking for basically reparations for previous actions as opposed to solving the issue so we don't make the situation worse, don't you create a, a, a bigger problem that, you, that, that, that could distract? But loss and, loss and damage is not happening in the past. It's happening right now. So what we are demanding for is for right now. We're not talking about cultures that have been lost in the past. Cultures are being lost right now. And people cannot adapt to the loss of their cultures. 
People cannot adapt to the loss of their islands and the loss of their histories. And the climate crisis is pushing people to these places. So what do you want by way of loss and, and damage? I don't mean a number. I mean, wh wh who are you looking at to pay that bill? I'm looking at the West to pay the bill. <laughs> Richard, just, uh, you know, the World Bank has estimated that natural disasters are costing about $390 billion a year. So that's a, a quite a bit of money. And that's why countries are saying, you know, poorer countries, uh, we need money for adaptation, mitigation, but we also need uh, resources uh, to help all the assets that have been destroyed. Uh, we need to stop that from happening. I'm not suggest. Yes, ma'am. So I'll jump in here again. I completely agree the funds are required, but if I were to look at what is the goal, we've got to get to net zero by 2050 at the latest. For that, we need to start taking a number of actions now. And let me take two examples of actions that have been taken that have been meaningful. One at the government level, one at the corporate level. If you look at India, solar power in India today is at 2.7 cents per kilowatt hour. It has come down mm. in magnitudes. The country had set a target to be 20% renewable energy by 2030. That was met nine years ahead of schedule in 2021. Mm. The target has now been increased to 50% by 2030. And the goal that is being set for the cost is going down from 2.7 cents to 1.3 cents by 2030. So that's tangible action that has been taken already. Second, if I were to talk about corporates and talk about what Mahindra has done. While we started our journey in 2008, we set targets for 2025 for energy productivity to be 100% or double productivity by then, uh, to have renewable energy at 50% by 2026. And where we stand today, we've achieved 74% of energy productivity already. And we are at 45% of renewable energy. We are water positive today as a group. But, and we're still going to miss the target? Uh, no, that's... I mean, the 1.5 the 1.5 degrees. We're still on track to miss the... the the, the climate talk. What I, 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 I admire the successes, yes. but what I want to hear now from you all is this idea, um, Jesper, that it's all about, it's not so much I'm now about grand policy statements. They've been Paris, et cetera, cops Absolutely. up to a zoo. It's the <clears throat> nitty gritty of execution. What's the difficulty? No, well, I, I say, uh, of course, it's an array of challenges, and I just want to, of course, acknowledge that the, the aspect of adaptation, mitigation, needs to coexist. We need to be able to have all these conversations at one time. So I think, for, for me, it's not a can of worms. It's actually the reality we need to approach. And there are dilemmas in that. But again, on the side of reaching, striving, and working towards the 2030 and the 2050 target, which I think few companies will stand up and say it's easy. Because when you open up to scope three, you're a full value chain upstream from your raw material to consumer, you, you will have headaches, you will have dilemmas, but you will also have opportunities. And then comes, as you said, to the nitty gritties. It's about how do, you, how do we get access to permits to get wind up? How do we change the policy, like Netherlands have done when it comes to mattresses, which is a big part of the climate footprint in my business, so that we actually can recycle not only our own old mattresses, but every old mattress. How do we change into a sustainable consumption model? And again, I think I'm very hopeful we are going to do it. The thing that stresses me is more that the clock is ticking and we don't have a lot of years now to turn the trend. Why are you optimistic? Can we also no, no, please, no, just a moment. Can we talk about the need to put an end to all new fossil fuel investments? Because I'm not hearing that conversation. Right, well, we, we You're looking at me? I think it's a very, it's a brilliant conversation. We have to end it. But I, I feel like it's really missing from this conversation because well, if we are to talk about the need to, you know, limit global temperatures mm. to 1.5 degrees Celsius, the IEA has made it very clear that we cannot have any new fossil fuels. That is oil, that is coal, that is mm. gas. Can we talk about that? Talk but, about but, it. But that brings talk, me... But talk about it. Let, let me, we, we can talk about that, but, you know, that brings us to another subject. I think it's very good. And one of the reasons why I think the world is not doing so well as it should, what you're saying, is in spite of all these examples, 
it's not to scale, so we are not making an impact. Uh, because we are not being, uh, first, countries are not uh, implementing their national determined contributions right. the way they should. Mm -hmm. That's one. Two, we are also not being real uh, in, in terms of the fact that there needs to be a transition. Uh, you know, it speaks to the issue. Fossil fuel, yes. But, you know, countries need to have a transition. Look at what is happening now in Europe and the dependency right. during so, this uh, war. So I want to ask Vanessa about that. <clears throat> I want to ask her about that. So no new investment, no, you, you, you want to stop all new investment in any form of fossil fuel extraction? Yes. And what percentage of our current energy production comes from fossil fuel? Well, almost all the energy exactly. comes from fossil fuel. So those companies that currently of the providers of, which I know anyway from my business coverage, are finding it extremely difficult to get investment. Uh, Boston Consulting will tell us that it is very difficult to find investors who will invest in uh, fossil fuel production, correct? It's getting harder and harder, yes. Is it hard enough? I no. think that's, that's the dispute. Yeah. I, but if it gets I, to, I, but that is still the principal form of energy. So, how, so you've got two choices now. I'm trying to get you to be realistic here yeah. mm -hmm. uh, on this. Yes, it's the art, you know, in the same way with, in Europe, with the sudden decision to produce more coal because of the lack of oil coming from Russia. It's a fine argument to have, but one of the panel, one of you take this argument, at what point do you suffer? What point do you look down to the camera lens and say to the public, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to suffer? Okay. You, you are talking about the need for Europe to invest more in coal for energy, right? No, I'm talking well, at the moment. Uh, that, at the, the moment. <clears throat> and I, I just really want to comment on that. No, I'm talking about the need to replace Russian oil. Therefore, there was this su suggestion and the idea to increase the production of coal in some cases, even though there was going to be a bad effect as a result. Let's talk about what the climate crisis has done at the expense of the investments of Europe. Historically, the African continent is responsible for less than 4% of global emissions, and we are seeing some of the worst impacts of the climate crisis. You said we talk about the reality. Let me talk about the reality. The African continent is suffering some of the worst impacts of climate change. We have seen cyclones from Cyclone Idai in 2019 that left more than 1,300 people dead and many more were recorded as missing. We've seen the Eastern Africa drought that has left more than 26 million people with no access to food. And I feel like we are not talking about the reality. But the reality is, you're right, but the reality is to reach your goal, and you take this, Jesper, will involve a level of hardship, Jesper and Gozi, mm. that... We have... So, well, let me finish. <clears throat> I haven't asked the question yet. It will involve a level of hardship in the developed mm. world that so far political leaders are not prepared to inflict, yes or no? Yes, they are not prepared because politicians find it, they have to get elected. They find it very difficult, like now. You know, if the, the, the funding, I mean, paying almost 800 million to a billion dollars a day for Russian uh, uh, gas, it's very difficult to tell people who are going to vote for you overnight that you're not going to have gas for heating and cooking. It's very difficult to tell them that they have to make these hard choices. But sometimes, if you're a brave leader, you have to have the courage to tell people that these are the tough choices we have to make. So I, <clears throat> I fully agree. And, and I think, if, again, I cannot speak for, for the politicians in this case, being unelected um, in this position. <laughs> uh, but what I can tell you, which is I'm being brave now to be a bit optimistic again, we are on a massive high-speed uh, course of decarbonization in our company. And it's not only the company as such, it's the value chain with sub-supplies through, actually throughout the scope three. We have invested more in wind and solar than we consume as a company in totality. We haven't connected it in every node and dot yet. 
But it shows one thing that I would like to raise into this debate. It's smarter to invest in the new than in the old. And exactly. that has to be also, even if there are some short-term measures that has to be taken, which I am not uh, uh, the, the most competent on, I'm sure that this crisis is actually pushing the agenda in the right direction. Completely. And if anything, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the Ukraine crisis has pushed Europe further and faster towards renewables and that. But Vanessa, that's not going to be enough, is it? I know that Europe is considering looking for gas in African countries, so that is not enough. Mm. And it's only because of the interests of Europe and the national security concerns of Europe. But can we, for a moment, discuss the national security concerns of the Global South? We have opportunities to invest in clean energy. Why aren't we taking that direction? Why are we still thinking about opening up new coal power plants or gas or oil, yet it's only harming communities that are least responsible for this? You may bring the investments in Africa. You are the ones benefiting. We are the ones who suffer the impacts. And Gozi, why is this in the sense that there, there is a vast difference between the demands, the, the instant demands of the developed world and the developing world at the moment. And they don't seem to be able to be easily reconciled. Well, uh, they don't seem to be easily reconciled because of the short-term outlook of policymakers and politicians. So they want to serve the people at the moment. Mm -hmm. It is very difficult when you're elected for a certain number of years to think for the next 10 years, you have to be exceedingly brave. And some leaders do that. We've seen leaders make very, very tough decisions uh, that serves their country in the longer term. So the short-term wants and needs of the, of the global north, the fact that Sometimes renewables may not be sufficient base load power for manufacturing, and you're talking of getting people out of jobs, may lead them to these decisions. Now, on that point in terms of short-termism mm. of politicians, there, there, is a, uh, there is an element of short-termism of CEOs. The average tenure of a CEO is how long? Three and a half years? Two, five years. Five years. <laughs> half a year longer than politicians. I'd Sorry? Half a year longer I think in the US it's about three and a half <laughs> the, uh, currently. But... When you are charged, uh, Anish and, and Christoph, when you're charged with turning a company around, improving the balance sheet, dealing with stakeholder, the stakeholder economy, whatever that might be, mm -hmm. <laughs> the temptation is you know you've got to do these things, but you'll get around to it. I'm going to offer a very different perspective on that, Richard. Mm -hmm. Let me look at it from the selfish angle of a CEO. What are the key things that a CEO is concerned about? Talent, investors, delivering results. How do we attract talent? We attract talent by having a purpose for the company. That's why people come there. That's why I've joined the Mahindra Group. That's why many of my colleagues have joined us. Second, as we think about delivering results or investors, let me come to that first. All our investors are asking us about what are our real actions on ESG. And we are attracting investors by actually being committed to it. And this is not about being committed on paper or talking about it. You actually got to deliver results on that front. Uh, if we look at financing projects today, if I were to think of building a coal plant today, not that I would, uh, I'd find it extremely difficult to get anyone to finance it. But if you're thinking about financing for EVs that we're doing or for our solar companies, we've got a line of financiers clamoring to get in. So that world has changed, and that has changed dramatically in the last 12 months. And then the third part I'd mentioned about delivering results, right? none of this is stopping us from delivering results because, as Jasper has said, you've got things that are actually beneficial for the company. His actions in the Netherlands are actually commercially positive for the company as well. And we found a lot of those things where there's a return on investment. We've done 2,000 projects in the last 15 years on climate change. And we actually have a payback period of two and a half years per project on average. 
and a return on investment from there. So all of this actually comes together. So this is not about us making a choice saying, do we do climate change or do we deliver profits? It actually, you have a purpose, and that purpose will deliver profits. So uh, this, uh, this idea of talent, which I think is worth mm -hmm. looking at a bit more closely, because I've now, I've now done three panels today. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one was on LGBTQ issues. The second one was on... <laughs> you forgot. The Great Resignation. <laughs> the Great Resignation. People <laughs> wanted to move, thank you. And the third one is country. And the, that same issue has come up again and again. Yeah. Uh, which is employees, uh, freelancers, whatever, they want to work for companies or bosses or in enterprises where they can have an impact and where there is impact. How true is that, do you think, for you? I think it's massively true. I mean, we all are confronted with that every day today. Yeah. I think there's also a bit of a realisation that, I mean, of all the stakeholders that are confronting a company and on the consumer side I do think you see some movement but I mean I'm personally relatively disappointed that the consumers are not a lot more demanding and vocal in terms of what they ask for in the product etc I mean we all still uh, buy cars we all still uh, fly etc I think there's a lot of reality that the consumers are relatively uh, kind of nice in terms of what they say, but then how much does that translate into manifest demand? I think, Richard, there's more disappointment than, than success on that front. I would say for many CEOs at this point, the employee base is and the, and the recruiting base is much more uh, limiting and traumatic and right. short term. And I mean, you lose people. If I look even at my own company, uh, BCG, I mean, where do people go? They leave to join climate tech startups, they uh, go to ESG firms, uh, et cetera. And I do think it is an incredible pull for talent. And you see that also in automotive, you see it um, in consumer goods. I mean, where do people go? They go to companies where they feel, well, I have more of a positive impact and uh, it makes a difference. So I think of all stakeholders, the investors and the employees are probably the ones that make the biggest difference. The other thing that I feel is now getting more relevant is the whole kind of cascading of carbon reduction targets through the supply chain. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, we spoke about scope one, two, three. I mean, uh, the reality is many, many companies have given some form of target. So just just yeah. as a remind if, to, to anybody watching who's not familiar with scope one, two, and three, I'm sure people in this room are, but anybody watching, scope one? Also, scope one and two are basically the things that the company uh, produces or emits itself, and scope three is upstream all the supplier emissions and downstream all the consumer or customer emissions. So scope three is the real complexity. I think most companies have a relatively easy time measuring scope one and two, but scope three is hard. And um, we did a survey a year ago, 1,200 companies, most of which have communicated some form of target. And we asked for a self-assessment, uh, do you really measure what you emit. And what came back was 9% of the companies said we truly comprehensively measure. So there's this whole target setting, pledging uh, reality, and the, the, on the other hand, only 9% really measure what is truly coming out there. So now what is happening, this is going to 20, 30% relatively fast, there's progress. But now as there is progress, I think one big lever to get carbon down in the supply chain is that IKEA, you go to your suppliers and you say, look, I've given a target, I need scope three to come down, can you please commit and do something? And you see that also with the automotive companies going to the chemical and the metal producers. I think it's happening, but of course it also takes so, a bit of time. So let's talk to um, um, Anish. Obviously for a large company like yours, and indeed yours, I suppose, the, the mechanisms of scope three must be very difficult to actually to, to, to get into your supply chain and get the, the, the necessary information with integrity back must be difficult. Not as difficult as it seems. And let me first talk about scope one and two. We actually not only measure it, but we have it audited every year. So we've shown a 20% reduction in scope one and two over the last two years. Uh, we've looked at where we will be in 2030 if we don't do anything more and what are the actions we can take to reduce that. Scope three, let me take the example of automotive. An average car will emit 35 tons of carbon in its lifetime. Uh, 
how do you reduce that? If you go to 100% EV, you go from 35 tons to 27 tons. That's still a lot. Mm. And while we talk about EV, that in itself is not the solution. If you go to 100% renewable energy, you go from 27 to 7 tons. The balance 7 tons is what comes in from the materials. Mm -hmm. And this is where the First Movers Coalition is playing a significant role by having companies commit to certain targets to buy green steel, for example, to buy green cement. Uh, we have signed up for those targets now. And that's starting to create a demand for green steel because they're saying that, okay, if someone's going to buy, then we will put in the investment for the technology. Uh, and that's how you reduce that seven. So that is our roadmap. Maybe. Just right, because no, yes, you are, your supply yeah. chain must be absolutely huge for all your products. It, it is, uh, of course, like I would say in any consumer uh, industry, it's a huge and you have first, second, uh, third tier suppliers. And then you have, if you have a large brand, you have millions of uh, consumers. But the thing is, that is also the beauty with it, that because the question is, are we mitigating a problem or are we redesigning economy? And of course, we need to mitigate some parts. But to Vanessa's question, which I don't have a clue the answer. Why would you invest in old technology for a period, unless it's absolutely desperate, I could imagine, if you have the opportunity to invest the same money in the future? And the same thing goes, so it's not only to go to suppliers to say, could you please do your part? It's rethinking what is a product, what is the material? How do you design it for separability? How do you create circular loops? And this is gonna take a few years to get down the road, but it's gonna make things more affordable and better as we take out carbon. I just wanted to, to comment that, um, you know, these efforts being made by companies is laudable. Everybody, we have to use every single tool we have. But we also need to think about whether we can look at common methodologies mm -hmm. uh, for pricing carbon, for taxing. Uh, right now, every the, it's good, let all flowers bloom. But sometimes it's not easy for businesses themselves when different jurisdictions have different approaches. It's very fragmented. Right now we have about 70 different mm -hmm. carbon pricing and taxing systems uh, in the world, everyone approaching it in their own way. And I think that the good thing to do, particularly for developing countries and developing country businesses, can we approach it uh, from a global carbon price uh, uh, perspective, and I think right, we but there's can. different. There's different. Obviously, uh, different industries require different mechanisms for that. But but let us set set it, and then uh, if we set a global carbon price with segmented, mm. let, I'm just saying those. Right. Let me look at it on a country basis. Those that are poorer, you know, uh, are facing a, a different price from the middle income, from the rich. You know, there is a, a, a continuum. Right. But carbon pricing... And those who don't want to can benchmark themselves against this. Carbon... Well, first of all, I mean, the, the, the thing you're talking about is, frankly, your organisation, the mm. WTO. N not just... Not just me. No, but, I, I mean, you're, 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 you are the organisation that would put in place the negotiations for a more... Oh, I, I feel we can be the place, yes. Why not? We have developing countries, we have developed countries. I think we are a proper forum to have this conversation because in doing this, if you don't involve developing countries who already feel that all of these things are a kind of protectionism, you will lose them. Mm. So I think it's the right place, but we can collaborate with the private sector to get their input with other multilaterals, and actually we are doing that with the IMF and the World Bank so and would, OECD. I want to talk about collaboration in a second, but Vanessa, this question of carbon pricing, which you know, every industry is involved in, to me often seems like a good way of avoiding doing too much too quickly because you're basically saying if you, you, if you pollute, you'll pay. And if you pollute more, you'll buy somebody else's carbon pricing, and that's a sort of an, a market mechanism for it. What do you think on the on the on the concept? Do you see carbon pricing as a con, <coughs> or as a way to actually make a, a, an improvement? Uh, what I can say is that whatever thing that is done by companies, it shouldn't pass off as greenwashing, because there is also a problem of companies 
saying that they are doing something, for example, embracing, for example, carbon pricing, and yet it's passing off as greenwashing. So I think it's really important that we weigh in on what is real action towards the climate crisis and what is passing off as greenwashing. Uh, there is something that was mentioned about mattresses, which um, I really appreciate. I think every, every action is important. But then what may be frustrating if the investments in fossil fuels are way you know, for example, you find that governments or business leaders will invest, will say they're investing in clean energy and say they're investing like millions of dollars and yet trillions of dollars are going to fossil fuel projects. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to understand the heart behind, you know, carbon pricing or the heart behind whatever action that is taken mm -hmm. so that it da it's not you're, not, you're not just doing it right. to please investors mm -hmm. or to please shareholders, but you're really doing it for the planet and for the people. Mm -hmm. Yes, but and then we're going to speak to hear some people from in the room. Very so good. Have some and I would, I would maybe add to Vanessa also. And the, then when we make this economically right, it's going to be one of the best forces to drive it. I then I would like to say to Nagos's point, I think we all, uh, corporates, we, we welcome the standards. Uh, but as you said, we need to have coherent one standard if possible because it's so messy right now. When we have that standard, something is two things will happen. Uh, many things will happen. But to, to Vanessa's point, greenwashing will be legislated against, so to say. It's not going to be uh, only a bad moral thing, but it's going to be a, a breach to, to policies. The other thing that will happen is that people actually doing good things will dare to speak up. Because today, all these great examples, you have to almost be a detective to find them. <laughs> They're out there, but people are afraid of raising their voice because it's a bit unclear uh, how you will be assessed when you do. And that's not good. I would agree with Vanessa completely. Greenwashing is an issue. And that is something that does need to be addressed directly. One thing that gives me some optimism on that front is in a conversation that a few of us were in uh, at the World Economic Forum a couple of days ago. You've got the four, the big four, coming together uh, to create a set of metrics that they will audit across a large number of companies. Right. And that is what's really going to be a litmus test in terms of saying, is it greenwashing or is there real progress? Yeah. And a number of companies have signed up for this already, uh, and that list is expanding rapidly. You know, Just to yes, one course. last point on this, and I think when it comes to fossil fuels, I mean, obviously you have a supply side. And we need to talk about that, and Vanessa, you, you make the points there. We also need to acknowledge that there's a demand side. And um, you always run into economic chaos and incredible disruption if you try to work on one of these two and not on the other in parallel. And I do think all these mechanisms, carbon pricing, uh, carbon border taxes, et cetera, are having an impact on demand. And I do think we also need to, I mean, uh, to some extent, expect the consuming industries to get their consumption down massively. And I think whatever uh, drives into that direction is going to be important. The room. All right. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a long night. Oh, that's a question. Uh, you're more than welcome to make statements. You're more than welcome to ask questions. You're not welcome to make a speech. <laughs> <laughs> so right, the lady over The lady. <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you. Speak up. Yeah. Um, so I hear a lot of talk about uh, the, the big companies, but I work with um, really grassroots people and, and very small companies. And I see that uh, it's, it's still very, very hard <laughs> to convince them to move. Right. Um, we are framing it positively, but um, do you have something <laughs> to say about that? I don't know for you. Get some free advice from BCG, you'd have to pay a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'd be more than welcome. I do think it's very real. I think, if, I mean, look, the, this incredible complexity of measuring, reporting, getting certified, audited, all these things. I mean, you can do that if you're a multi-billion dollar corporate. I think it's so hard if you are the family-owned business with seven people 
uh, and you are basically even struggling to do your normal financial reporting at the end of the year. I think you are spot on. I think what we find in many industries is that the higher the share of small and medium enterprises in the supplier base, the, more, the harder it is to cascade uh, the whole effort through the supply chain. And I think it's a very real challenge. Now, big companies start working with their suppliers to help them you know, and also uh, get them into a position to report and measure. But then if you have multiple big customers, I mean, you get different systems, different tools, and it's becoming really complex. I think it's a very real challenge. It's one that concerns me a lot. Um, and I think in some very heavy emitting industries, for example, if you look at the agricultural uh, supply chain, I think it's going to be a, a big challenge for many years. Okay, I, Can I have two, two yeah. short comments on it, just for the debate? Uh, is that okay, Richard? Yeah, of course. You look, yeah, very good. I think I, I don't have, you pro probably have a richer reality uh, than I have in this, but I meet a lot of SMEs who really want to, who are morally driven by this, and they're looking for business opportunities, but they don't know the methodology. They don't know what scope one, two, and three is. Uh, so I think, and it's one of the things that I'm going to address myself, and I know others as well, how do we actually bring the incitement method and the methods to people? and try to connect them because the engagement will be possible, I think. I would love the debate on that. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Jeff Richards, AO Foundation. I'd like to see R&D money for removing cadmium, nickel, lithium from batteries to make them more environmental friendly. And secondly, also, the elephant in the room, nuclear fusion, which will help replace fossil fuels. Are you in favor of it? <laughs> yes. Are you in favor of it? I am. I think it's the elephant in the room. What is it? We need more nuclear power. Yes, we need more nuclear power. Having said that, I'm also going to say that your opening question was excellent. When you said, kind of you. how will you have climate become prominent in this battle with vulnerabilities? Right. I just want to say... No, please don't. <laughs> I just want to say that improving climate action needs four things. Oh, dear. Decreasing carbon, <laughs> decreasing emissions, decreasing waste and decreasing vulnerabilities. Right. Everyone ignores the last. Um, are you in favor of more nuclear? Round the panel. <laughs> you in favor of more nuclear? You think I'm going to answer that question? <laughs> I'm going to ask you, Anish, to answer that question. <laughs> Come on. I, I think we need more information on that to make a call. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of people into the negative around that. Vanessa. Yeah? Nuclear. No. Thank you. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, just keep talking. Yeah, so thank, thanks, Twitter, for being so flexible in the... So, so as you're so flexible, my question is to you. No. Yeah, come on. <laughs> I mean, it's in, I mean this, of course, you've been playing a, a, an excellent role uh, on, on the show that we have been seeing, but what happens with media? You're representing the public oh, opinion. What does okay. it cost yes. so no, much? No, this no. is a cultural <laughs> change, and oh, we need no. media to be... Uh, helping on. here. Here we go. It took, I, I'm just looking at the clock. It took about <laughs> 45 minutes before the media got blamed for something. <laughs> <laughs> That's longer than I would thought it was going to be. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is for Ngozi, yeah. because you talk about global commons. And mm. to me, the, uh, carbon pricing is one way to shift the economic, economic system, which does not appreciate the value of global commons. Mm -hmm. The carbon is maybe the only, only single currency in the market which try to measure the cost of destroying the global commons. Is that possible, you think, that to also expand that and the measure to the broader natural capital? to shift to the market? I think, I think so, yes. I, I think you can. I, I absolutely think so, Naoko, but we have to start somewhere. And we should do it. You know, maybe I'm an economist, but the only way to get people focused on things is to put a price on them as much as you can. That doesn't mean they don't have other value, but it gets uh, people to pay and attention. Can that work in time? Because the issue now, as I can see it, is not that we don't know something has to be done. And we don't, and there's enough policy documents to burn a forest several times over. But can pricing and economic forces per se bring the necessary pressure in time? I, I think so. Look, we have brain power. If we decide to do this thing, it shouldn't take time. You know, it's not, I'm not saying it's easy. Uh, get me, don't get me wrong. 
but we can do it and it will simplify things for everyone, for countries, for businesses right. and so on. Real time. Hi, I'm Vaishali Sinha, run a clean energy company in India. Fantastic, Vanessa, more power to you. You're doing great work. I saw you last time. Keep up the good work. Just want to say that, of course, we, you know, we're talking about should we accelerate this transition, etc. But the question also is that what do we do where there is no energy? There, we're talking about an energy transition, yep. but we should also talk about what do we do to the 13% of the world which has no energy? I think folks That's sitting a on this. Issue. No, I'm sorry. That's a different question. It's an important question. Right. But it's not. Uh, in the sense okay, that... Okay, I'll take that back for a second, just that we need to focus <laughs> on a just and a fair transition. Yes. That's an important part it of is. this. Yes. It That's is. That's what Vanessa was talking and, about, and, just and, and, and so a fair... we can do more, uh, you know, we have right. foundations here, etc., and we need to think about that. You got the last one. Yeah. Better be good. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Pranshu from Karasamba, India. So, how do we price circularity? This is now a new challenge, and there is a lot of debate. Uh, from all the work that I have done, it seems it is less than a percentage point uh, compared to the average selling price of the product. But we see, are seeing almost no action at a grassroots level in terms of creating collection systems, recycling, right. getting it back. Richard, can I, please? This is my favorite topic. Oh, I'm yeah. a believer <laughs> that the energy transition has started and it's unstoppable. I believe that the mobility and transport transition is in, maybe it's still early days, but it's, it's happening. The circularity needs to be pushed. And the interesting thing, the mattresses that I love to talk about it until people fall asleep maybe, but the cool thing is that that's the material of the future. That's the best, right. lowest price of raw material. If we remove policies to subsidize incineration, if we don't, the economy will never work. So you, you talked about policies that were a bit more granular. If we address the policies to make it possible and shift subsidies from the bad to the good, uh, circularity will happen very fast. I, I want to finish on this thought for the panel. The one, the one change you're going to make in your daily life or in your life as a, to help but small things. You're all CEOs and government leaders and activists, so you have the power to make major changes for tens of thousands of people in the global economy. Get it. I understand it. But what's the one small change? You, you start with Ngozi, then, to give us a... <laughs> yeah. I know, I'm yeah. making the question as long as possible to give you time to think about it. Very good, thank you. <laughs> Maybe anyone in the audience. One change. What's one change? <laughs> Don't make a speech. I want the one change. No, no, sorry. One change. Pricing no, that you're going to make. I'm ready with mine. Oh, you are? Yes, because <laughs> I'm doing it. Then it's not a change. Okay, no, but uh, I just started. Oh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to go on. This has to do with uh, precisely the circularity issue, recycling. Right. Really committing myself to recycling. And it's not as easy. You know, we are used to a uh, uh, use and, and throw away uh, culture. So that's the change I'm making. Your recycling. What are you, what's the, the one change that you're going to make? I've made so many changes. I don't know what else <laughs> to change. All right. In my company, PCG, we have 1,600 partners who own the firm and who make decisions every day where we go, how we travel, how often we do that. Every one of the 1,600 needs to see a display regularly, monthly or even weekly, how much these decisions are driving in carbon. If you send your teams this way or that way, you hold a conference, what carbon does it trigger? I think in so many companies, if you measure things and put them in right. front of people so, regularly, I think it has a massive impact. And I mean, usually we look at it with way too few people, make it available to a much broader set of stakeholders. So, uh, forgive me the journalism in me. So, the change you're going to make is name and shame your partners. <laughs> I, I will name and shame the partners and also give them the reward if they make progress. Oh, so you're, going, so you're going to you're going to use the economic method. Name, shame and bonus. Yeah, I would say measure, incentivize and celebrate or shame if it doesn't work. I get it. Sir, the one change. The change I would make is measure my carbon footprint. Oh. What is that today? Where does that come from? And then set a target for reduction for that and then find a way to meet that target. 
I'm going to measure my children's carbon footprint and uh, no. So uh, <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm going to do, uh, with not that's too complex. No, I'm going to engage my 170,000 uh, colleagues in my company to be ambassador, to know what I know and make sure that they can be proudly part of telling the story. That is such a corporate answer. No, it's <laughs> a personal I answer. I thought you said personal. Yeah, I it's did say it. Thank you. you Sorry, the, the, the Director General has said you were saying it personal. Uh, <laughs> it's a super personal thing for me. All right, thank you very much. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, our panel. Thank you.